we know that you and I are made of matter, what we call baryonic matter. This is what we call normal matter. So this chair, our planet, the bark of all of the trees, that's only around 4% of the total energy, mass energy budget of the universe. The rest of it is made of stuff that we have no idea. And the rest of it falls in two categories. One of them is dark matter, which is around 25% of the rest. And the rest is called dark energy, which is like 70, 70%. Dark matter is the mysterious glue that binds the galaxy together. They don't emit visible light or any other uh, electromagnetic radiations, so we cannot see them. However, we can detect them through their gravitational pulls and also detect them through their impact on the evolution of the universe. However, we don't really know what they are. Are they um, new type of particles? Are they the manifestation of new forces? That's, uh, it remains uh, one of the greatest mysteries in all science. The discovery of dark matter is a complicated, long story spanning decades, but the, the first, probably the first evidence for this was uh, a guy named Fritz Wicke, who did observations of uh, a large galaxy cluster called the Coma Cluster. This is a bunch of galaxies sort of whipping around each other, big groups of stars moving around, and he found they were moving very fast. And they're moving so fast that the whole cloud should have been flying apart. And the fact that it was held together meant there was some force holding it in there. There was some gravitational pull that was stronger than could be accounted for by the stuff we could see. And so he inferred that there must be some other material we couldn't see. He called it dark matter in German. And uh, this idea sort of sat by the wayside for decades. So in the 1970s, uh, a bunch of work was done by uh, Vera Rubin and Kent Ford and collaborators studying how galaxies rotate. Rubin and Ford were able to do precision measurements of the speeds with which the stars orbited the galactic center. And they found that, just as with Zwicky, they were moving so fast that the system that's bound together by gravity should fly apart unless there's some additional mass providing more gravitational pull. It's like you, uh, you're whipping a, a ball around on a string. The faster it goes, the harder you need to pull on the string to prevent it from flying away. It's exactly the same principle. And that additional gravity is more than can be accounted for by the stuff we can see. The way that we know absolutely 100% for sure that it's not some form of you know, clever, rocky arrangement of normal matter is from the cosmic microwave background. Now this is this uh, diffuse glow, it's sort of the background light of the universe. It's not visible light, it's microwave wavelengths of light, so similar wavelengths as the electromagnetic radiation in your microwave. Uh, and so this is the universal background glow of the cosmos. It came from about uh, more than 13 billion years ago when the universe uh, was very little, so it's like the baby picture of the universe. It's actually the glow of from back when the universe was a hot plasma, when the whole universe was this soup of ionized gas. And quite literally, the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe, set sound waves moving in this fluid. And we can see the imprint of those sound waves, like ripples in a pond. We see them as hot and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background today. And by looking at those sound waves, you can understand what the substance was made of. So it's the same way you can listen to an instrument and hear whether it's made of wood or made of metal. And similarly, we can tell what the early universe's plasma was made of. And we can tell that back then, just like today, most of the mass was in some, uh, was in some dark form. A small portion of the matter in that plasma was interacting with light, providing the springiness of those sound waves. But most of it was just providing gravity. That tells us that not only is there matter we don't understand today, but that same matter was present in the same proportion in the earliest days of the universe. So we know that dark matter is there, and we know with very good precision how much of it there is. But we don't know what it's made of. We know that there's a lot of mass that's taken up by dark matter, and so any particle that makes up dark matter must carry mass. It can't be charged. If it were charged, it would interact with light, and then it wouldn't be dark. It must be stable, because if it weren't stable, if it could decay to other particles, then it wouldn't be there anymore. And so our current best guess is that dark matter is composed of some new subatomic particle that is electrically neutral, stable, and massive. There's a few classes of these people consider. Some are called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. That's like a big, heavy neutrino. There's others called axions and countless other ideas that 
Uh, I, you could never list them all. There's an amazing variety of ideas. They all share the general principle that you need something that is not going to interact much with ordinary matter. There could be billions of these particles passing through your body every second, and you wouldn't know. They would move through the empty space in the atoms of your body, leaving no trace. So to have something be dark matter, you have to have ideas about two things. One is you have to figure out some way to get it in the universe in the first place, and the other thing is you have to figure out how to get just the right amount left over. Because if you have too much, that's a disaster. Your universe will fold in on itself and crunch. If you don't have enough, that's also a disaster. Your universe keeps expanding faster than we see it expand. And often you won't even have time for galaxies to form before the universe just you know, keeps merrily expanding away. So there's lots of ideas. But one of the best ones is, what if the dark matter talks to the standard model? So when I say standard model, I mean specifically the standard model of particle physics, which means this describes the interactions of all the particles that we have seen so far. And so you imagine that back in the early universe, uh, when it was very hot and interactions were therefore going on you know, really fast, uh, that the dark matter talked to the standard model. And then as the universe expanded and cooled, these interactions got slower and slower until they froze out. And that, you can do the calculations, when exactly does this freeze out? And you get about the right answer. And then you can compute, OK, here's the amount of dark matter that I need. Here's how strongly it has to talk to the, the particles that we already know about. And then you can say, all right, the particles we already know about include us and things we can build experiments out of. And so we can check and see. We've got some definite idea about exactly how strongly dark matter has to talk to us. So let's go see if it's there. Understanding dark matter is one of the great pursuits of modern physics. And there are basically four complementary ways that we search for it. The first, and the only one that we've ever actually seen dark matter with, is using telescopes. So doing cosmological measurements, looking up at the sky. The second are so-called direct detection experiments, where we build super sensitive detectors, and dark matter particles strike those detectors on Earth and leave signals in them that we can interpret to be evidence of dark matter particles interacting with the detector. The third are so-called indirect detection experiments, where we look for two dark matter particles in the heavens that annihilate, and then their decay products reach detectors on Earth, and we look for those decay products and measure them. Um, and the fourth one is the one that I do, which is particle accelerators. It's been compared to trying to understand how a watch works by throwing it against the wall and looking at all the gears and sprockets that come out. But it's the best way that we know how to do it. And what happens is, when we collide two particles that are going at high velocities, and they smack into one another. They annihilate into pure energy. And out of that energy come new particles. Most of the time, they're ordinary particles that we have seen and understand in great detail. But every once in a while, something interesting emerges from that energy. In the same way, we hope that when the protons collide into pure energy, we can create events where dark matter particles emerge. The Earth and the Sun basically move together around the center of the galaxy. So we kind of move through the wind of dark matter. So if we have an ordinary detector we put on the Earth, we can actually see the signal produced by dark matter. So the idea is very simple, right? So you can imagine that the um, uh, normal atom is like a, a billiard ball, a small ball. Then uh, the dark matter can be another particle comes and uh, hit the, the normal matter. The normal matter recoil a little bit it transfers a little bit of energy to normal matter, and this energy turns into uh, photons, or phonons, or heat, uh, heat that we can see. But the challenge is to make the detector virtually background free. Not only you need to make sure all the materials are free from radi radioactivity, you also need to build a detector deep underground to shield it from uh, cosmic rays. There are um, maybe a dozen also other experiments in the world that works actively on this and use very different techniques. So because you can use kind of different atoms uh, to see the recoil energy. So we use uh, sodium and iodine. Other people use uh, argon, xenon, germanium. Galaxies tend to congregate together because gravity tends to sculpt uh, gravity and dark matter tend to sculpt the shape of, of, of the mass distribution in the universe. So what we're trying to do, and what we're trying to do locally at the University of Illinois, particularly with the Dark Energy Survey, is to make a map of the matter distribution in the universe up to very early stages. So how are we going to do that? Well, as observers, we can do it the only way that we have, which is by 
measuring the light from very distant objects and try to make a map. So we're trying to make a map in three dimensions. We want to know where galaxies are located in the sky and also how far back. So we're trying to make a 3D map. And the reason for that is that we can use the light from the galaxies and how these galaxies are also distorted by something called gravitational lensing to measure really all of these things that we're not seeing, which are the dark matter, which is surrounding every galaxy. And we can also have a handle of what dark energy is doing because dark energy, which is not dark and is not necessarily energy, but that's what we call the stuff that we don't have a clue what it is. What it's doing is making everything move away from each other. So you, we have this, uh, this tug of war between gravity that tra tries to make everything move together to coalesce gravitationally. And then we have dark energy that is pulling everything apart. Hopefully in the next, uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years, we will find dark matter and uh, that will be exciting. The hope is we can see it uh, in detector on Earth. We can uh, maybe produce it in accelerators and we can see it with uh, detectors in space. If you can see it in all three areas, we can uh, really uh, get a hold of what dark matter is then maybe there are practical applications of dark matter. We don't know. <laughs> what the universe is made of is, at least to me, just one of the most exciting and profound questions we could possibly have about the universe. So I study cosmology and fundamental physics, and I do that because we get the best questions. We get questions that people have been asking for centuries or even thousands of years. What did the universe made of? How did it get the way it is? And we're getting real quantitative information about these things. There's five times as much dark matter in the universe as there is regular matter. We have no idea what it is. We have no idea what it's doing there. We have no idea why the universe needs to have it. We don't know why the universe needs to have us either. Maybe these solutions are related. Understanding what dark matter is and how it interacts can very often tell you something about how it fits in to this picture and might explain why we have the set of particles that we do have. So working towards a bigger picture of you know, fundamentally, why are we here? Dark matter is an important part of that and to answer the whole question we have to understand first what dark matter is.